If you want to make yourself a DL44 blaster for cosplay or for some other reason, for quite some years the default entry level option has been this. These cost around $20, around £20 in the UK and around €20 Euros in Europe. It's not too bad but it does have one major inaccuracy. The scope is almost directly on top of the gun and this is completely wrong. The original DL44 was based on a late 19th century handgun, the Mauser C96. This was loaded through the top and there's no way you could reload it if you had a scope mounted directly above the body of the gun. On the DL44 then, this bracket would not be stuck to the side of the gun as it is here, it would be sticking out from the side of the gun in order to hold the scope out here to the right of the gun. You can get this looking quite reasonable if it's just in your holster and you're already dressed as Han Solo it's going to be pretty obvious what it's meant to be and many people have been happy to take these along to cosplay events for years. However, recently and at the same price there is now a far superior option. For a very similar price you can now get this 3D printed DL44. It's far, far more accurate with the scope being offset to the right side of the gun just as it should be. It has a moving trigger, spring loaded and the hammer moves. There is one downside to going the 3D printed route however and that is visible layers. The whole gun's like this to a greater or a lesser extent so you would have to put an awful lot of time into sanding it to get it absolutely perfect. The place where the layers are most conspicuous is on the base of the butt and around the trigger guard. Let's see how long it takes me to sand it down and get it looking ready for paint. This stuff really doesn't like to be sanded. When I got a bit heavy handed, I went right through it, just there. So I think the only way to get this smooth would be to fill the thing and then rub that down. I'll try just doing a little bit. I did notice that the print lines or print grain on the scope were particularly conspicuous. So I've coated the scope in a very thin layer of filler I'm waiting for it to dry now. I'll sand it back and see if that gives me a better result than trying to sand the print lines out directly. This filler is now dry. I'm going to have to give it a very, very gentle touch. And let's just see if we can't get rid of at least the worst of these marks. I thought I might as well paint this blaster as well so that we can compare the two when they're done. The first thing to do with these is to fill the screw holes and cover this screw here which I've done with the head of a drawing pin. Then you have to break out the ends of the flash arrester, drill the flash arrester and do something about the scope. I've made a small hole in this end. You might be able to see that this screw goes across the scope just inside that aperture so I haven't made the hole very big. At the other end I've opened it right out. With that the orange and white one's ready to prime. As for the 3D printed blaster I put it out in the sun for the filler to dry and when I checked it after five or ten minutes I was appalled to discover that it had started to warp in the heat. The bracket had started to bend and had actually torn away from here. So I glued it with two-part epoxy and left it to cool down in a bench vise for half an hour. Let's try sanding the parts I've filled. Well, once I've rubbed this filler down, it's gone really quite smooth. It'll be interesting to see how smooth it looks with a coat of primer on it. The 3D print lines are very much in evidence all over this piece, particularly on the underside of the heatsink in front of the magazine. I'll have to fill that. 
it's not my intention to try and make a museum grade piece out of this because what I hope to demonstrate is that this is a viable alternative to the orange and white one because they cost about the same and on the face of it this is more realistic however if it turns out that this takes five or six times more prep time than the orange and white one then really I can't argue that it's a viable alternative Here's the orange and white one with a coat of primer on it. While I was sanding off all the letters and logos, I noticed it's called a ruby, so that's how I'll refer to it from now on to distinguish it from the 3D printed one. After applying the primer, it's actually a good idea to take note of any areas that still show the telltale flash of orange or white, because these difficult to reach areas must be ones that you concentrate on absolutely when you give it a coat of black. While I was priming the ruby, the filler was drying on the underside of the magazine heatsink. I think it's time to sand this off, but it's worth pointing out that after just 10 minutes in the sun, this whole gun is now bowed like a banana. It was dead straight when it arrived in the box, it was dead straight when I put it out in the sun, and it's now very good for shooting round right hand corners. Here it is from underneath. If you want a DL44 as a movie prop or for role play, then really not being able to leave it lying around in the sun is quite something of a huge disadvantage. If, like me, you plan to paint it and hang it on the wall inside your house and never expose it to sunlight, then it's really not a concern, but you should know. With the filler on the underneath of the magazine, dry and sanded back, it's time to prime this. I've chosen to prime this one with a red plastic primer because I've run out of grey. With the primer drying on the 3D printed blaster, I'm going to go ahead and give the ruby a coat of flat black paint. This is how the print looks now the primer's dried. In fact, the print lines are far less conspicuous on the areas where I experimentally filled and sanded it. So there on the rear of the scope, there on the front of the scope compared for example to the flash hider. This is how the heat sink on the front of the magazine now looks after I filled it. Time for a coat of flat black. Here's the ruby, looks quite good from the left. Here it is from the right. Here's the 3D print. I'll just take that masking off the flash hider. Here's the print. The ruby's ready to get some paint and the first thing I'm going to do is to mix some acrylic black with some acrylic metallic silver and make up a dark silver paint with which I'm going to touch up the flash hider. I'm going to bring out the highlights now using the dry brushing technique. There are so many videos on YouTube, even DL44 videos, which cover this that I'm not going to be doing it on camera. This is the ruby, as you'll see when I turn it round. Hopefully that's enough, but not too much. This is the printed blaster. I haven't yet painted flash hider. On Han Solo's DL44, I think this bit was made of brass and I'm certain there was a brass rim around the rear of the scope. Ruby first. Here's my attempt at simulating a brass component painted black in the factory and used for many years. Here on the ruby is my attempt at depicting the worn brass ring fitted to the very back of the scope. 
On the 3D printed blaster the piece is more accurately modelled. I'm not as pleased with the way this has turned out as I was with the first one. I've overdone it. But I can tone it down with a black wash. I haven't attempted to do the rear of the scope with a brass like effect because I don't like these two marks. I want to do something to get rid of them. Here's a look at them both after initial weathering. The next thing I'd like to do is to glaze the scopes. Okay, brown painted grip panels. After that I can get on and glaze the scopes. This is how the grip panel came out on the ruby. I did them pretty basically with just two similar shades of acrylic paint. On the 3D print I used two different brown shades of spray paint and then added a dark acrylic wash. I'm hoping that the mottled effect I've achieved here helps to suggest the surface of an old patinated piece of wood. It's time to correct an error I made right at the beginning. The 3D printed blaster actually arrived in two parts and I glued the barrel on. Unfortunately I did it upside down so the ruby's correct in having this little blob at the bottom and this is wrong. Usually I'd be quite irritated with myself but not this time because the barrel is so crooked that I'm glad of the chance to cut it off turn it the right way up and glue it back on straight. Here we go. The barrel is quite a lot straighter and it's now the right way up. Next thing glazing the scope. Let's start with the ruby. Because it's not a particularly accurate replica the hole in the front of the scope is pretty small but I have an idea for that lens. I have here a broken pair of kids binoculars. They've only got one front lens but if I unscrew this out pops this little thing which I think is about the right size for the front of the scope. Here we go. I've tried to set it in more or less flush. Now what about the bigger hole at the rear of the scope? It's not really all that round. As for a material from which to make my lens, I've got this. A clear styrene cassette box. See if I can cut a circle more or less the right size. Here's the glazed rear of the ruby scope. As you can see, I didn't cut it to fit particularly well, but it is nice and flush, so I shall be able to cut the ring of styrene to glue over it to hide the imperfect join. I've marked out the shape onto a sheet of scrap plastic. I'll cut that out, bevel it, paint it black, and glue it on. There's the scope and there's the eyepiece. Just needs painting. I've painted the ring black and brassy and with that I think the ruby is complete. What about the other one? For this one I intend to pull out all the stops and use the big front lens from the pair of Charles binoculars that I've got. I do need to cut it down though to fit just inside that hole. This is the lens. It is actually an optical lens as you can just about see there and I've cut it down concentrically so that it will hopefully glue neatly into there. Well I have glued it in place and while I'm waiting for the epoxy to go off I'm going to turn to our trusty friend the cassette box which provided the rearmost lens for the Ruby's scope and cut a smaller lens 
for the front of the print scope. I managed to get the rearmost lens in without getting too much glue everywhere and I like it because it does look like you're looking through a scope. It is a lens, not just a flat piece of polycarbonate sheet. So now to glue the small flat lens onto the front. Here you can see how I've marked out a rim for the rear of the scope and cut out one for the front just to tidy up the junction between the lens and the tube of the scope itself. How do they compare? Here we have the print on the right. You'll notice that, for example, it has the original Mauser's fitting to accept a shoulder stop. There's no denying that this looks more realistic, but we have to remember that to get it to look good close up, would take an awful lot of work due to these print lines while the ruby of course being injection molded has excellent surface finish quality. I think the print's other chief disadvantage is its frailty. The ruby is extremely sturdy you can not worry about it. This you have to mollycoddle a little you can't leave it in direct sunlight and bits will get snapped off far far more easily than they would on the ruby. Ultimately the choice is yours. They cost around the same to buy. It depends on whether you want realism at a distance, good quality surface finish close up, realism at the price of strength and robustness, a huge sacrifice in realism but the thing's cheap and quick to prepare. For my part, I can confirm that if I ever want to go out and about and take a blaster with me, it'll be the ruby I'll be taking because I won't have to worry about its well-being the whole time. The 3D print can live happily on the wall at home in the exposed barrel automatic section of my gun wall. When I began this comparison, I was heavily biased against the ruby and in favour of the 3D print because the Ruby does make those compromises in terms of scale realism with regard to the position of the scope relative to the rest of the weapon. However, I now see that it's horses for courses. Each has strengths, each has weaknesses, they cost around the same, and ultimately, it's up to you. So, thanks for watching.